The following presentation was given at the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Tupelo in Tupelo, Mississippi. All are welcome to join us on Sundays at 11 a.m. at 1301 Marshall Street in Tupelo. So, um, my sermon title, Looking for Spirituality in All the Wrong Places, I don't know how many of you remember a song from a while back called Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places, uh, which appeared as a song in the um, movie Urban Cowboy back in the 80s, uh, the young story of a young couple who found each other in a sort of western bar situation. But uh, it applies to a lot of things, looking for things in places where whether it be love or a path to greater spirituality, we often think that only certain situations will yield what we think we're looking for. And I think it makes sense for most people to think that while well, they're looking for spirituality or peace or uh, sort of the greater understanding of the big picture things in the world, that we look in places where those things have habitually been seen to somehow dwell. So if we're on that quest, we will tend to end up in a building like this, a synagogue, a temple, a church, many different varieties. We may end up going to weekend workshops on spirituality in any one of a number of traditions. It could be Christian mysticism or Kabbalah from the Jewish tradition, or it could be a Zen Buddhist workshop. We take classes. We might go away for a weekend retreat and feel sure that at the end of that 24-hour or 48-hour period, we will return as a new person. Well, that rarely works out too well. You might be a new person for three or four hours, and then, I don't know, the plumbing gets clogged up or something, and you're right back to your usual irritable and possibly irritating self. So, so these quick hits don't work. Some people take trips, sort of pilgrimage, conscious, the Camino in Spain has been a hot uh, pilgrimage site recently, our location, and I think people now, it's become so well known that if people go and take that trip and they don't come back having had a Paul on the Damascus Road level epiphany, they feel like they have somehow failed. And in fact, all of these pursuits can sometimes lead us instead of to feeling we are now on a higher and better path, can lead us to a sense of failure. And partly that is because, just as love is very idiosyncratic to the person pursuing love and the person wanting to love, uh, people don't necessarily seek the same thing, even though we have the same word. So just as love is very idiosyncratic to the person looking and the person that they end up finding and hoping the two of them find something together, spirituality is completely idiosyncratic to individual people. There is no one size fits all, which is why looking for spirituality, as I said, in all the wrong places can be an expensive and frustrating quest. So let's say you pay several hundred dollars to go off on a Zen sitting retreat and you find out that you can't sit still for more than five minutes. So what are you? You are a terrible failure in your self-judgmental mind, I suspect. All of us have what the Zen teachers call monkey mind, minds that jump quickly from one thing to another, and some people can calm that faster than others. Um, I use this example because I am a total drop out from all forms of conventional sitting meditation. I have tried everything and none of it works for me because I have one of the most active monkey minds in, the, in creation as far as I can tell because I suffer from sort of ADHD, you know, attention deficit hyperactive disorder or as my mother used to call it, fidgety. And so I just fidget and go off on wild fantasy trips when I'm trying to sit and meditate. However, I learned later in life that I am not necessarily a total failure in pursuing ways toward greater spiritual growth and enlightenment. I just had to find what worked for me. Our transcendentalist ancestors, the part of Unitarian Universalist history, 
that took place in the Boston, greater Boston area, primarily in Concord, New Hampshire, and other parts of Massachusetts and nearby New England states. These folks were very aware that the same thing didn't work for everybody, that spirituality was not a one-size-fits-all kind of operation. And they very brilliantly came up with four major pursuits that they thought would help them in their quest for the transcendent. We find our transcendentalist ancestors enshrined in our current Unitarian Universalist um, presentation in Source One, the search for that, that transcending mystery and wonder found in all cultures. And they pursued it primarily by four major activities. And again, none of these might work for you, but it does indicate that they use these four different pursuits. Some of them used all of them, uh, some of them used one or two, but nobody excelled at all four. These are the kind of things that Emerson, Thoreau, Hawthorne, Melville, Margaret Fuller, and all the dozens of Unitarian ministers whose names have for the most part been lost to history were pursuing during that very exciting time in American spiritual history. Most of them kept journals. Most of them were, had some kind of writing interest or talent and journaling was seen as a way to self-examination. Uh, people sometimes, again, thinking of looking for things in the wrong places, buying a little diary that gives you 10 lines to say, dear diary, at the end of every day is not journaling. Journaling is writing for anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes at any time of the day that works for you and trying to give some serious thought to something that is either troubling you or preoccupying you or interesting to you. And at some point you will find that maybe you're saying things in paper that you didn't know that you knew is an interesting aspect of a regular journaling practice. The other practice that many of the transcendentalists, our forefathers and mothers, used was walking. Sometimes it was referred to as sauntering. They were a hardy group and could walk even in the dead of winter. Many of them even did snowshoeing. But they found from the walking, which was usually done in nature, although some could walk around in Boston and find things, but they would use those walks not just for exercise, but to notice. They would see animals, birds, trees, and different states of nature, a pond, what have you, and they would take notice, be aware of the mystery and wonder of that, what they were viewing. If they were in the cities, they would perhaps notice the poor people, they would notice the uh, various things on view for entertainment, notice things being shown in the stores. They were always open to see what was there. The third pursuit that a lot of the transcendentalists engaged in very actively was what we would now call, I guess, devotional reading, although their ideas of devotional reading were not the little snippets that sometimes we see in different little booklets that are available everywhere from a Christian church, like a little, sometimes they have these little daily word things, or the Buddhist epigrams from a book on sayings of the Buddha, they tended to be more involved, treatises on philosophy or uh, religion. They had a capacity that I fear most of us have lost for fine arguments and for uh, wordsmithing. Sometimes reading some of the kind of things that they read is pure torture for modern people because their writing was pretty turgid. I don't know how many of you ventured into Emerson and Thoreau on your own. But even I have to say, with both an English background and a theological background, do not exactly take, in, take them up with um, great pleasure, <laughs> although I have read a lot in all those areas. But for some people, 
these things got their minds going, and their minds just opened right up and led them to perhaps then go back to their journaling practice and write something similar of their own. And the fourth practice that, again, I feel has fallen into some a state of disrepair in our modern culture was conversation. They engage in a kind and level of conversation that I sadly don't find too often these days. I personally am blessed with some old friends and a family of storytellers and people who like to rehash things and try to find you know, new things in, a, in an old story and people who really enjoy talking about topics more than just arguing or yelling at each other about politics, which is, seems to be the main subject of conversation today. But conversation can be both personal and abstract. I think that people that seek medications and professional therapy could save a lot of money if we relearn the fine art of friendship and deep conversation with friends. Again, I've been blessed with a lot of um, friends who are willing to let me use them as um, an unpaid <laughs> helper, and I've tried to return the favor to some. It doesn't always work, to use a term we're talking about a lot today, quid pro quo. Sometimes I return the favor to somebody who has not extended it to me, kind of a pay it forward thing but I find that usually it kind of evens out, that sometimes simply having an in-depth conversation and sharing with others our vulnerabilities. Now clearly Facebook and things like that do not lend themselves to these kinds of conversations. And anybody that thinks they're Facebook friends or friends, as I've said before, are clearly delusional. You know, people, I think it's actually, I love Facebook and I use it a lot, as any of you that are on there with me know, uh, perhaps it kind of comes across as somewhat self-centered because I tend to give people a little snippet of what my life is like at any given time along with readings that I find interesting and enlightening. But I do not delude myself in any way that I am having a therapeutic conversation through Facebook. I don't imagine any of you do that either. So the four Practices that we learn from the transcendentalists are helpful, and any one of those or any combination of those, I highly recommend. There are other systems of thinking about how we are and what kind of spirituality might we actually find that would work for us and not make us feel like failures. One such system was developed by a Unitarian Universalist minister named Peter Tufts Richardson, who I'm pleased to have made personal acquaintance with and talked to a couple of times at various general assemblies. Peter was a big student of both world religions and also of Jungian psychologist Carl Jung, who gave us not the actual system, but a basis for understanding different kind of personality types, as it were. Now, I've always been a skeptic in general, and I'm kind of a trained skeptic, I guess, having gone to um, you know, Harvard, the place that says that you should trust nothing, and you know, nothing is quite what it seems in a way, as which is considered to be the best posture for a good scholar. But so typologies are very uh, tricky things. I don't, how many of you are familiar with the Myers-Briggs typology? So basically, Myers-Briggs took four Jungian concepts of extroverted, introverted, somebody who's more outgoing and somebody who's more less so, and then sort of some people are what you would call an ambivert or in the middle. They took qualities like thinking versus sensing, being, in other words, a more of a physical view of the world with a more abstract thinking view, and qualities like uh, intuition and feeling and explain those that some people operate more out of their feelings and respond, not to say that they can't think, and people that are thinkers can also feel because we all have these capacities, but we tend to have chosen ways that we approach the world. So okay, then some other psychologists took those ideas from Jung and expanded upon it and added a fourth, cate a fourth category of judging versus uh, perceiving 
which means some of us are anxious to come to an ultimate conclusion, and others of us are well, just happy to just keep wandering around forever gathering new data and never really come to any final <laughs> conclusion. I fear that I am guilty as charged on that one. So Peter, Ta Peter Richardson took that uh, Myers-Briggs and Jungian thought and came up with something that also mirrors another typology that came out of the Hindu tradition in India. And in his book, I have it on the back table there, if any of you would like to take a look at it, it's something that might, I think you'd find quite enlightening. The book was called Four Spiritualities, and he comes up with, based on the thinking versus intuition and the sensing versus, um, I'm sorry, sensing versus intuition and thinking versus feeling, he comes up with four types that kind of might have unique spiritual practices that appeal to them. And I have done classes on this in the past, and I have found that people who had thought as I did about my inability to do any kind of sitting meditation had felt that they would forever be in spiritual kindergarten and could never go on to the advanced group. I have found that this kind of approach can help people feel much better about themselves and about their potential, shall we say, spiritual potential. Um, I don't agree with everything Peter said. I think as we, most writers do in an effort to create a finished book and at some point get it to his publisher, he made some decisions that wouldn't be the ones that maybe other people would make about who he thought exemplified different styles. But I think his fundamental insight is brilliant and it's that it goes perfectly with a much more ancient uh, insight of the, the Hindus. So Peter talks about what he calls the path of unity. He says that people that tend to come out on the Myers-Briggs as an intuitive thinker were likely people who are going to respond well to the written word and are going to be the sort of people that go to the library or the bookstore on a regular basis and load up with things. Again, guilty as charged. He uses, this is the, the Buddha, and well-known uh, thinker and uh, sort of architectural genius and so on, Bucky Fuller, is examples of somebody who's on this path. But this is the path that in um, the Hindu tradition would have been called uh, Raja Yoga, or the yoga of sort of the intellect. Um, and th these people literally gain insights and get into a kind of spiritual high from their reading. I can't tell you how many times in my life I have completely been unable to prepare a sermon properly because as I pursued one source, I suddenly found myself wandering through my bookshelves and finding other things that I thought would lead me in a better direction that ended up at three in the morning with no sermon and having found about five additional books that I needed to put my attention to immediately. So it doesn't always work out perfectly. But it does, it is through reading and through the sort of reader's high that I have perhaps gained whatever uh, spiritual advancement and development that I have. But it does not work for everybody by any means. In fact, it tends to be a minority path both according to Richards and among UUs and also among the millions and millions of Hindu practitioners. Another path that we see frequently in our area especially is the path of those who have more of a sensing and physical view of the world and who primarily call upon their feelings and emotions. And this Richardson calls the path of devotion and the yogic tradition calls bhakti yoga. It is a devotion, it's a yoga of devotion of love. If any of you, I don't know, Tupelo may not have been a good enough sized town to have a Hare Krishna population at the time that it was sort of running rampant all over the country, but you've probably been to airports where you were pursued by people uh, singing Hare Krishna and giving out little booklets. But you do know what the path of devotion is here because they have Pentecostal neighbors. 
even in the Jewish tradition, which we think of as kind of more intellectual and abstract, the Hasidic Jews practice this kind of devotional spirituality, singing, dancing, and in a way it can lead almost to what I would call a sort of trance state, often with the goal of loving, you know, God loving each other, etc. Richard sees Mohammed and St. Francis as practitioners of this. I'm not sure, I mean, Mohammed's probably an okay choice, but I don't know, he was such a warrior and statesman, I found it a peculiar choice, but St. Francis, yeah, yeah, St. Francis was definitely all about that love thing. But uh, still, neither of these are gonna work for a lot of people. So Richard suggests that those of us who see the world primarily through a physical sensing uh, entry point but use our thinking processes more to deal with what we take in are on a path that he calls the path of works. The Hindus would call that karma yoga. There you find a lot of Unitarian Universalists. This is your social justice warrior style. This is becoming a source of some controversy within our movement now because there is a huge push on something I think we're all in favor of, which is working on anti-racism and anti-oppression and being aware of multicultural influences, but has become a subject of some internal UU controversy because a particular um, brand of um, work called critical race theory has been sort of taken as now a, well, it's suspiciously close to a dogma, which many of us old style Unitarian Universalists don't care for, but it seems to be the running trend at headquarters, as it were. Luckily, perhaps not having A, a full-time minister, and B, being small, you will not be subjected to as much of that as many other congregations are. But to me, it seems like it, while the goals are laudable, and hopefully we all want a world where everybody is more accepted and so forth and has a cleaner shot at things and a more even playing field, um, I have not found shaming people to being a very pr productive way to create a spiritual insight. But at any rate, we all know that for some people, their way of expressing their spirituality is through doing something, whether it is protest, writing letters to the editor, or feeding the hungry at a food bank. This is where they see the spirit. This is where they see, in, a, in many ways, the possibility of enlightenment. Richardson says Moses, who led people, of course, out of slavery famously and hopefully into a new and freer life, and Confucius, the Chinese philosopher who focused a lot on life in the sort of political and realm of power as people who practiced this kind of karma yoga or the path of works. And finally, and this is the area where I fail the most, the path of harmony that Richard calls, which is the path of those who are intuitive but pursue the world through their feelings primarily. This is called Raja, I'm sorry, the first one was called Jam, I might have said Raja, I might have mixed those up. The path of unity is Jhana Yoga. The path of harmony is Raja Yoga. And that is what we normally think of as spiritual practices. That is the practice of meditation, various kinds of Christian and Jewish disciplines that have to do with uh, prayer and so forth. That is what we tend to think of as extreme concentration which eludes me personally, I will tell you, uh, as the sort of highest form of spirituality. But we now see from these typologies, it's just a possibility for certain kinds of people. So we do not have to feel like failures if our monkey mind doesn't calm down. We do not have to feel like failures if we are not one to get out there in the streets and, and work all the time in opposition to other people. We do not have to feel like failures if we are not scholars and people who haunt libraries and bookstores. We do not have to feel like failure at all because everyone has different things that work for them. There are dozens of other resources that I could send you to that would help you understand that you may not have found what works for you yet, and that may be why if you feel that you're sort of less spiritual or less 
far along a path of being a really fine human being than somebody else, you just haven't found the right thing yet. I, I might have told this story before, but I believe, unlike some people, that repetition is a positive thing when it comes to um, being a spiritual leader. Um, I found, an, uh, I'm not a crafty person. I don't tend to, I'm not a, I draw stick figures. Um, I've never learned how to knit very well. I don't crochet. But, oddly enough, something that worked very well for me once, and I had one of the most sort of enlightened epiphany moments of my life, was uh, fixing earrings, taking earrings that were made for pierced ears, which I do not have, and converting them to the kind of backs that I can wear that aren't for pierced ears. Now, this sounds terribly trivial, and tedious, and what happens to me is I tend to buy a lot of earrings because I like jewelry, as you may have noticed, and it's almost impossible now to find earrings originally that are designed for a non-pierced ear. It's one of those little oppressions we don't talk about a lot. There's no lobby for people that didn't want to pierce their ears. I have no recourse of how to change this that I know of. But I have found that some jewelry stores and places are kind enough to keep the backings that I need, and there are little tools that you can use to do this. Well, one night I was sitting up and I was putting the new backings on about 20 pairs of earrings, and because I'm not crafty and I'm not good at this stuff, it requires a tremendous amount of patience and presence for me especially to do this. And by gosh, if I didn't get high as a kite, I was just looking around with like, I, you know, everything had like a sort of shimmered and I was seeing, you know, everything from my lamp to my rugs just seemed like miraculous and gorgeous things. And I thought, I have had the same effect from putting backings on my earrings that I would have had from an hour of chanting nam myoho renge kyo or a lengthy walking meditation. Some people get this from cooking, or baking especially. There's something about the process of the chemistry of food preparation that literally, I think, becomes a mystical and spiritual experience for a lot of people. So there are so many things available to us than the things that we normally go to. So if we go and try two or three different things, especially if we pay money for it, and finding out that it hasn't worked, we tend to get cynical, self-condemning, as I said, and give up. But you never can tell when some surprising thing may get you to that place where you see what people are talking about when they say a state of enlightenment or a higher spiritual plane or a way of seeing the world as sort of inherently miraculous and awesome. We've heard about the runner's high, and sports actually are a way that a lot of people seem to have something resembling a religious experience. Dancing can yield a similar high, and even things like, for all of its downside, sports, football. I was just at the Grove over at Ole Miss yesterday, there's something about that communal gathering, eating, sharing food, talking to people sometimes even from opposing teams, and that spree de corps that gets people into a very different kind of convivial state than if they just had a couple of people over for a little dinner party. So there is no telling what your path will turn out to be. There is no right or wrong way to do the spiritual quest. No one gets an F in spirituality. You may have already found your path and just don't have enough time to pursue it as fully as you might in the future. One of the little books that I looked at in thinking about this topic is one called Indie Spirituality, and the writer of that uh, book is an unusual young gentleman who is a big fan of punk rock music, which we hardly think of as a spiritual thing, but he found in that particular community some sort of a, a sense of purpose and a sense of 
energy that seemed appropriate for him. I've talked in the past about movies, films, books, visiting museums or galleries, and I have found visiting aquariums. A city aquarium is the variety and beauty is so overwhelming and seeing things like ancient tortoises, turtles, and some of the varied creatures and the beautiful colors, I just find myself stunned. So we just never know. There are so many practices, there's so many paths. Do not let anybody else tell you that you can't get there, that you're on the wrong path. I highly suggest making use of some of these tools that I've mentioned to look and see what some of the enormous possibilities are that might prove to be your path to a new and higher state of thinking and being. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the UUC of Tupelo's podcast. You can find us at uuctupeloms.org, on Facebook by searching for UUC Tupelo, or contact us by email at uuctupelocom at gmail.com. That's uuctupelocom.com at gmail.com. The UUC of Tupelo is a welcoming congregation who accepts all people regardless of creed, color, national origin, gender, or gender identity. We hope you have enjoyed this podcast, and as you head on your way, go in peace, believe in peace, create peace.